we have uh, an amazing speaker tonight. So, uh, Young Ho, it's a it's really a pleasure that you joined us. Um, well, let me begin by saying, uh, for those who may not know me, uh, I'm Evan Douglas, the dean of the School of Architecture at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. <clears throat> and before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I'd like to acknowledge. Our generous sponsor this evening, uh, Frank Pitts, uh, class of 1975. In addition to being the founder and senior principal of the nationally recognized firm Architecture Plus, located in downtown Troy, uh, Frank has been a strong advocate for his alma mater over many years in his important role as a member of my Dean's Leadership Council. I believe Frank is in attendance tonight, so on behalf of the entire school, I want to thank him for his kind support in enabling us to bring distinguished architects from around the world on an annual basis to the School of Architecture. Uh, thank you, Frank. It's a great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, the internationally acclaimed architect, Young Ho Chang. A deeply thoughtful citizen of the world, uh, Chang has spent a good portion of his mature years attempting to grasp the quintessential character of the Chinese culture as interpreted through the discipline of architecture. The son of one of the leading architects in China during the Cultural Revolution, he has witnessed up close the profound political cultural and economic changes that have taken place throughout his homeland since the second half of the 20th century. Keenly aware of how the steady influence of the country's economic reform and social liberalization in the post Mao China have brought a welcomed prosperity to the country, Chang, like many of his fellow colleagues from his generation that have obtain leadership status in the arts and academia at this moment in their careers, he is also deeply uneasy about the loss of authenticity facing Chinese identity. While globalization has brought a wealth of opportunity to its citizens, it has also distanced its people from a rich legacy of cultural practices and traditions that underlie the unique ethos of the Chinese people over many centuries. For Chang, this is not a project of nostalgia for the past, but a thoughtful and critical assessment of how to reconcile one's profound cultural legacy within the context of a contemporary world. Rather than surrender to the ethically suspect forces of a market-driven economy that perpetuates an endless chase in architecture, for novelty and surprise, often with, without regard for its cultural context, Chang's practice pursues a more incremental and analogical approach that seeks to imbue distinctly unique Chinese ideas and practices from the past into the organizational, material, and conceptual underpinnings of his contemporary buildings. Conceived as a productive form of resistance, his world-renowned practice calls attention to the potential risk of an increasingly homogenous world, as well as our moral obligation as architects and caretakers of the built environment to consider our buildings of the future as important cultural reliquaries containing invaluable knowledge for generations yet to come. A few words about his bio, uh, educated both in China and in the US, Chang received his Master of Architecture degree from the University of California at Berkeley in 1984. Since 1992, he has been practicing in China and established Atelier Fei Chang Jianzu, FCJZ, with his wife and partner Li Jialu in 1993. He has won a number of prestigious uh, prizes, such as the first place in the Shik and Shiku Residential Design Competition, a Progressive Architecture Citation Award, the 2000 UNESCO Prize for the Promotion of the Arts, 
an award in architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the China Architecture Media Award Excellence in Practice Prize. His firm has been recognized as one of the 100 plus best architecture firms by Domus Magazine. Recently, his Shizhou Art Museum has won the American Institute of Architects AIA 2020 Architecture Award and the Arch Daily China Building of Year Award 2020 Award as well. He has published a number of highly respected books and monographs on his practice. His work has been exhibited internationally, including six times in the Venice Biennale since 2000. In addition to his renowned practice, he is also highly recognized for his impressive accomplishments as an educator. He has taught at various architecture schools in the USA and China. He was a professor and founding head of Graduate Center of Architecture at Peking University uh, from 1999 to 2005. He held the Kenzo Tange Chair at Harvard GSD in 2002 and the Saarinen Chair in Michigan in 2004. Uh, and between 2005 and 2010, he headed the architecture department at MIT. He was also a Pritzker Prize jury member from 2011 to 2017. Uh, it's a, as you can tell, it's a very impressive career, uh, and we're really honored and thrilled that Young Ho Chang will be joining us tonight. Welcome. So, uh, Evan, should I start my uh, talk? Yes, please do. Okay, thank you so much for your uh, very generous uh, introduction. Okay, let me uh, turn on my, my uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so you see uh, my screen now, my, my first slide actually. Yes. Can you? Okay. Can. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, first of all, for the delay because uh, I was so clumsy uh, with my, my uh, computer uh, skills. So, uh, it took a while for me to download uh, the web, uh, the, the, the app. But anyway, uh, the title of the talk is simply building. I like to uh, read a quote. Oh, I don't know if I can, I can't, uh, I don't know, for some reason I can't. It's not moving forward? Yeah, I, I can't turn the pages of my, my uh, PowerPoint either. Hey, Robert, can you hear us? Um, yeah, just select the, the, the PowerPoint app down there at the bottom to make it active. And then you should be able to hopefully advance it. Okay. Select uh, the PowerPoint in the dock. I see. Mm. Okay, I, I figure out a way to do it. Okay. okay. So let me read the uh, the quote. It's from Miss Van der Rohe, a name you all know very well. He said in 1959. Can you hear me okay? There's a bit of an echo. I, I don't know why that's the case. Okay. So anyway, me said, actually during an interview in, in, in the US already at that time, architecture starts with when you, I'm sorry, when you carefully put two bricks together, 
there it begins. For me, what it says is that architecture is the act of building. Now you know why I'm using building as, as my title. And then now I like to take two things in the quote, perhaps in a literal way. First of all, about the two bricks. Secondly, about the word careful. So you're looking at more than two bricks, but the idea, of course, is to put some bricks together. You're looking at a running bond, something very basic uh, and conventional. And that is how we started a very recent uh, project. And then we went from there to something a little more uh, elaborate as you can see. And then here is the uh, construction site. I, I don't know if I can, okay. So you can see uh, these uh, uh, mock-ups are there on the site. What's interesting, of course, is that building in the background. I don't know if that would have gave you an idea where the project is. That is the uh, Asian looking building in the background, actually it's not in Asia, it's in Paris. This is the international university city in Paris. The building in the background is the uh, Southeast Asian house. And our project is the, uh, the China house, which is a, a dormitory and then uh, you see the entire building in, in the form of a model. What we are trying to do is very different actually from the uh, Southeast Asian house, which uses some uh, uh, forms um, to express it, its uh, cultural ideas. What we're trying to do is use bricks in other words, to use construction and material as the cultural expression of this building. And so the, it's a, a brick building and, and with uh, uh, um, different ways of uh, um, laying out uh, um, bricks. So it's, it's more than, than running bond, it's more than English bond, more than uh, James Bond and so on. And then because of uh, COVID, as we all know, the project in Paris is terribly delayed. Now it's a, a pit in the ground. And then three weeks ago, and the uh, tower cranes were up. That was a major event. So anyway, so the idea is that when we talk about architecture, here we go. Bricks, wood, and the way they put together is very, very essential. So here you can see more bricks uh, on, on the left. And then of course, when they are carefully put together, meaning they are thoughtfully put together and then the, the motor joint becomes also a very important part of the architecture. And then on the right, when you put two pieces of timber together and then the metal joint becomes part of architecture. So in, it's a kiosk on the left and then a, a renovation actually of a historic building uh, on the right, which is going to be used for uh, 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 also learning uh, institution. And then to sum up what I have been talking is that architecture is about building, building is about material construction structure and space. So however, from there, I like to say that as architects, we build probably a little more just than the building per se. By building the building, we also could build, for instance, time and space experience. 
So you may wonder, of course, you know, we, uh, we know how to make space, or should we say we know how to design space, but can we build time or design time? My answer to you today is yes. So this is an, an example from uh, a, a Chinese garden. So you see an interesting form of a zigzagging bridge. However, the reason the uh, design, uh, I, probably he wasn't quite a designer, he was a builder, he was an artisan. The reason they, they twisted the bridge is to make the time span crossing the water longer. By doing so, they made the space bigger. So they designed both the space and the time at the same time. In fact, you can never really separate the experience of space and time. So that was a very interesting uh, inspiration uh, for me uh, um, as an architect. So for this project, which is still under construction, is an art museum where we thought maybe we could try to design both space and time so that not so much to make the place look bigger, which is on a very tight site, but rather to let people to experience the space in such a way and the time in such a way so that in the end, they probably would lose the sense of the size of space and time so that they would experience a kind of a, a immeasurability of space and time. So the way we did it, this is a plan, it's actually kind of a straightforward. We manipulated the perspective. I'm just showing you a, a few, uh, as you can see, it's still under construction, showing you a few spaces so that uh, you get a bit of a sense of how this perspective is uh, uh, manipulated, meaning sometimes it is exaggerated and uh, some other times they, they are uh, um, being flattened and so on. So when you go through the space in one direction, you get one experience, a different direction uh, experience on your way back. This is the store you enter the museum from um, you know, where you get your tickets and, and also uh, gifts. And then, and then you, you pass through uh, actually a water court with very exaggerated uh, uh, perspective. And then you would lose a sense of the depths of the site. And it goes on and on. And uh, I just gonna flip through uh, some slides, but you can see uh, actually the perspectival uh, um, quality. Here, the same space leading to the ma major uh, exhibition hall is again tapered. And, and, and then, uh, uh, so the space is expanded in one direction and uh, perhaps shortened on the other way. And there's a light space only a kid would be able to enter because it's very low, it's about 1.5 meters, <laughs> how many feet that makes, I don't quite remember. Anyway, and then the, the big exhibition hall, again, the uh, uh, perspective is manipulated. And so the roof you are looking at is a pitch roof, but it slopes down and then uh, it makes a, the space appears even longer. And the tea house, and a curved linear perspective, uh, a totally flattened uh, perspective here. And of course, finally, you see a two-point perspective. All the spaces you have seen 
were uh, one point, the Renaissance uh, perspective. And then a triangular courtyard would, would give you a, a different uh, a spatial and time experience. And then back to one point, but you can see uh, uh, better at the uh, the materials we're using. And here is concrete poured on site with wood formwork, a very old technique. And then we use, of course, uh, uh, also traditional clay piles as one of the main materials. It's used on roof, and it, uh, you know, the material, the clay tile, has been always used for, for more than centuries, probably for uh, over thousands of years, and uh, we use them also as the wall, and as a. Uh, uh, a lower wall from the outside, and then uh, of course uh, on the inside. So, and then you see the uh, the uh, coexistence of the old and the new. And then this is the uh, better photo I can show you at this point. From this angle, it doesn't look quite like uh, a construction site anymore. So the whole point again is that, of course, if you measure a project in terms of time and space, and then you get how many meters wide, how many meters long, and then how many minutes would allow you to walk from one point to another, but actually, we wonder if you suspend these scientific tools for measurements, and you can allow yourself to be lost in in a spatial and and uh, temporal uh, or conditions that uh, you would uh, discover something little more about them. So this is uh, about the very basic and essential experience we have all the time. But now I'm gonna go to uh, lifestyle. So can we build lifestyle? Can we design lifestyle? Again, I, I say yes. Uh, this building, as you know, uh, is in Illinois, designed by the person who wanted to, to say architecture is about putting uh, two pieces of uh, bricks together. Ms. Wendero, when he designed the building, he didn't just offer a shelter, he offered the client, Dr. Fonsworth, a possibility to have a different lifestyle. So I have very little knowledge how uh, Dr. Fonsworth lived before, but when she moved in here, she probably had to start to invent a new lifestyle by herself, but also with the suggestion by the architecture. And, and again, for me, it's a very interesting idea. We can't see a lifestyle as a static thing. And then as architects, we should get involved in making and, and changing lifestyles. Here is a house on the west bone uh, of, uh, of Shanghai. It may not look very much like a house. Uh, some people thought that the, uh, the ventilation for the subway uh, underneath, well, there is no subway uh, there uh, near the, the river, um, the, the, the Huangpu River. It is a house where when you go in, you realize the house is connected to the sky and earth underneath. In a way, of course, it's a glass house being flipped up. So we call the house the vertical glass house. If 
Mises house is for the open landscape. This glass house is for the city. So and then, however, in the city, you are still very much in touch with the nature, with the sky and the earth. And then, of course, in between, you have the uh, uh, the domesticity and manifest it in terms of utilities and, and furniture. And then, of course, another view and uh, showing if you are not living there, there by yourself, and, and then the view and uh, showing if you are not living there, there by yourself, and then the view and what showing what is happening. If what you are happening? not living there, happening? there by yourself, and then the view and uh, showing what is happening. If you are not living there, there by yourself, and then is there a problem with the audio? Um, Hello. It seems like you corrected it, Young Ho. Oh, it's, okay. it's okay. It's okay now. Oh, okay. Anyway, actually, you can see uh, people uh, more than one uh, uh, person uh, uh, in the house. I imagine originally, uh, way back in 1991, when I drew uh, some drawings for a design competition in Japan, I thought it was for one person, but. Uh, and then uh, some uh, uh, when the house was built, some friends they want to take the whole family in there, and they thought it was it was fine. It, it's very interesting to me. It's not a, if uh, it's possible or not. It's their imagination, the inhabitants' imagination to see how the house can be used uh, in in uh, in other ways than what the architect thought. So today, at this very moment, we're making or rather building four experimental houses. In each one, we imagine some way uh, of living that is probably not the, the typical one and not the one uh, on the real estate market yet. So here, uh, I'd like to show the house in the back first. It's uh, another version of the split house. We had one built in the uh, uh, many years ago, 20 some years ago. And this one is for uh, an imaginary scholar. And, and it's kind of a simple, actually. It is on one side, uh, on, on your left, um, is uh, on the upper level is an open living room and on the left is the uh, uh the study which is uh, quite enclosed there's skylight and and just a small window however the scholar's life is very much evolves around uh, during the day uh, with this body of water, it's actually just rain water in there. Uh, uh, the photo was taken after a heavy rain, but it's going to be a pool in the middle and with a platform bridging the two uh, halves of the house. So basically, you you go you move from work to uh, to uh, live uh, by crossing the water, and uh, so that's the idea. So you're living with this canal or pool. And then, interestingly, uh, in this house, you are looking onto an art museum designed by the Portuguese architect Avro Siza. That's uh, the curved linear form you can see from here. So uh, I only have uh, just a few photos because I'm thinking of showing quite a few projects since they are not done yet, uh, these houses. So I'm just going to go through them fairly quickly. So you're back in the village, and now let's go into another house. And actually, you see the house here on, on your right, and then you see a tip of something poking out from the house. And that actually is uh, two, uh, uh, rather to say, a cruise form beam inside the studio. The house is for intended for a painter or sculptor, some person works with uh, plastic art. 
the 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 beam actually uh is for uh people or the uh, artists to go up and to uh look at uh, her work uh, or his work the person up there is one of my colleagues a young architect just try uh, too anxious to uh, experience, experience the beam so we're putting handrails now uh, of course and uh, and and, uh, and then just uh, completing the house so the artist can go up there and then to look at again her work or, or his work and then can turn around to see the landscape outside so this house is about living with the beam and then the next one is about living with a roof every house has a roof but this roof uh the, the house uh in the in in the back there in fact it's inverted so inside of the house you uh it's like the the previous houses so you go from the house i'm sorry the uh the the uh working uh quarters the studio and to the living quarters uh on the on the left so you have to to see it as just one space in the house but also you can see it as two uh two uh, spaces sharing uh, a house uh, they're together but you don't see uh, the other side And then here is the living quarter. So, and uh, of course, uh, it's, it's in, in uh, still just uh, the, uh, uh, the very, very uh, unfinished uh, stage. The last one is a little behind. So I'd like to show you some uh, um, drawings I did again many years ago. So it pretty much take us uh, for these houses, I can't remember how many years, but I would say more than 30 years for them to be realized. So I did these drawings around 19, also 91, 1991, 1992, when I was actually teaching uh, in the US at, at Berkeley at that time. So the idea is that, uh, it's another version of a glass house. I was terribly interested in in glass house, and I thought, since a glass house designed by by Miss Wonderful or Philip Johnson, they were so open that uh, they uh, didn't really offer the uh, inhabitants much uh, privacy. Maybe uh, I could do do yet another version of it with privacy. So it's very much about the glass house enclosed by a courtyard, walled courtyard, so that you have a transparent house, but also you have privacy. So you can look at the model. And then the studios are studies, exhibition space, anyway, workspaces are on the ground floor. And then on the upper level is a glass house. Here is a construction site. You can see uh, how the two levels are, are connected by a, a, a cruise form a glass a courtyard, glazed courtyard. And here is a construction uh, site. You can see the quality of the uh, um, concrete. And again, uh, we used uh, uh, wood formwork so anyway and this is also a very exciting moment on the construction site when when some uh, uh, mules coming along uh it's it's actually pretty unusual i don't really know the reason why because usually you you see only cars in, in these big cities in in china uh but anyway we they were very much welcomed and then the uh, construction team sent me a, a photograph uh, right away. So 
we saw the building uh, of uh, the uh, temporal and spatial experience as well as lifestyle. Here I'm getting even more ambitious. I'm going to show you uh, how we have been trying to build education. In order to build an education, we uh, started, of course, with our clients, the school, the uh, China Academy of Arts in the city of uh, Hangzhou. Uh, we're building a new campus for them. So the uh, president of the university asked me uh, to help them to build not the campus first, but the education no system. And he simply said, you know, you have been teaching for so long. Give us also uh, you, you, your ideas of uh, an, uh, an uh, ideal uh, uh, education based on, on art. So that's what I, I came up with. It's all in Chinese. And I, I'm very sorry about that. But it's a simple idea. In order to take advantage of the uh, the all the art disciplines on campus, so I suggested let's ask every students when they come to these universities to take a course which would allow them to use their hands. It could be painting, could be uh, uh, making some machinery or could make buildings. So it's about use their hands. And so that they learn to think with their, their, their head and hands at the same time. That becomes the most important uh, foundational uh, uh, course they, they would take in this uh, particular school. So as I, I just mentioned, you can see architecture not becomes a, 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 just a, a profession. It's also it's a, a foundation, a part of the foundation of the education. And then the major of the students would be decided later on. And, and then uh, we imagined also a different uh, space for learning. For me, it's not so much about what the student would be working on by herself, but rather is how while working on a project by herself, she can also learn and discover what other students and the faculty are doing inside of the school. So it's a very open studio. She can see someone probably uh, someone she uh, doesn't know working on something she doesn't recognize probably uh, in the corner of the studio and then she could approach the person and and to discover something uh, she's very curious about and, and make a friend and then when she enters upper level she and uh, her friends can team up uh, and 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 then tackle up uh, a research project. It, this kind of openness uh, resulted in uh, a form. Of course, uh, it reminds people probably of a uh, rather uh, old uh, studio and, and a workshop. But the idea is to actually have a very open education. So when they graduate, the reality is that there's not going to be a, a the, you know, for our students, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine that there are, there are institutions, a lot of institutions, our schools, uh, they, they would, uh, they would uh, uh, need uh, uh, um, new blood and uh, let alone for these uh, young people to start their independent practice and so on. So we're imagining by having this open education the young graduates are able to uh, to design their own career. So, and then the whole university, the entire campus are connected by these studios. 
Meanwhile, they live upstairs from the studios. These uh, white blocks you can see in here, they are all dormitories. So they can go down to work on their projects middle of the night uh, if they, they so wish, or they can uh, during the day uh, go upstairs and take a nap. It's sort of a living, studying, kind of all combined uh, together. And that's a scenario we uh, we kind of agreed upon with with, with uh, the uh, the school. So here is where the project is. It was planned to open uh, last month, but it was again the COVID. Now it's delayed to the spring. So I'm uh, actually uh, very curious and anxious to see how uh, students and the faculty would uh, would uh, respond and to uh, re uh, react to uh, the new campus. So, so you get the idea of the studio and the uh, the dorms, and that's how the studio space would be like. Another view of the studios. And then you can see how many layers of the spaces uh, uh, it would, would would have, and then it creates sort of a kind of an infinite. Uh, uh, well, that's an exaggeration, and the list would be another exaggeration. How 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 deep the perspective uh, of the studio is, so you can really see a person far away, um, and then get a whole. Uh, um, view a kind of panorama of the whole uh, um, campus uh, all the time. And the end uh, of the studio, the gym with a, a different, uh, but, but uh, again, a similar roof form and inside uh, the gym. So, okay. Uh, from education, let's try to uh, build a uh, tradition. For me, uh, as architects, we're dealing always with what we consider very important, uh, uh, of course, heritage, which are the uh, buildings uh, built uh, before uh, our, our, uh, in our practice. So in this case, in the city of Chongqing, we were given a, a very uh, complex uh, challenge, actually. That really the, the black ones, these are buildings which have to be restored. The dark gray one is the one could be renovated. The, uh, the three lighter gray ones are the ones can be uh, uh, rebuilt. So with that, we're thinking, so we're literally not just restore the buildings built during one period, which is late. Um, the, the oldest one is, is built, they were built in the late 19th century. But rather is to build the development of architecture through uh, uh, about 130 years. So it's, it's about building a tradition. So you can see uh, uh, from this aerial photo, uh, again, the uh, four uh, buildings restored and the one renovated and three new ones. Because uh, these buildings actually on a very steep site along the uh, Yangtze River, this is a, uh, the Yangtze River, and then there you see a band there, and and then uh, um, so the uh, the site condition also is very much part of the uh, architecture. So this is how much uh, our project is a close up. You can see uh, all the buildings are united by a very much a similar roof form, which is of course uh, is a, a double pitch roof. However, there are different building or uh, construction methods. Ram earth walls. There were some buildings were built with ram earth, and the restoration work required us to redo so. 
and then tile roof, also very traditional. However, inside this restoration, you can see not only the uh, old repaired trusses, of course, made of timber, and then in the back, for the collapse half of that building, we actually introduced laminated wood and used a new structure, which looked like this. And then you can see, uh, um, it's not exactly a repeat of the old structural system, but yet use something that echoes that tradition, but is contemporary. So when people come here to visit, hopefully they would discover how the uh, timber structure in China has evolved, at least in the past uh, 100 years or so. And then for the new buildings, we use the bent steel, steel frame, uh, as you can see here. And then on the outside, of course, the new buildings look also different, but in harmony with the old ones. It's an isometrical pitch roof offers uh, offers cover, and you see the eaves to uh, the steps. And then this is a corner of the new buildings using the local sandstone, which wasn't used in the uh, the uh, old buildings, and also uh, making a, a a more contemporary detail out of it with the steel uh, structure. And then uh, here you can see old building restored on the left and uh, a renovated building at the end. And then on the right, actually, uh, uh, it's a, a new wall. All the colors are similar because the earth and the stone were all from um, uh, very, very, uh, just from Chongqing. Is, they are all very local. Another view uh, gave you a sense of the different uh, uh, buildings uh, from uh, different periods. It uh, makes a, 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 a together a harmonious whole. So getting even more ambitious and then uh, uh, talking about how architecture could address not only tradition, but also a community, perhaps even a society and, and, and as well as a city. We were asked to design a museum in a rather remote town in the mountains of uh, the province Hunan. And, and the uh, city initially gave us a site, a uh, very beautiful on a, a piece of open land in the, the, the new uh, uh, zone of uh, the uh, um, development um, and outside of the old city where actually um, more of the uh, population are, are, are living. So I thought uh, why people should uh, make an effort to go out of where they live to see art. I, I'm an art lover and sometimes I'm lazy to make such an effort. So could we actually uh, turn the whole thing around to bring the art to the center of the, the, the densest part of the city? And then so people would, uh, would uh, encounter art with literally no effort, which of course the city uh, is the center of the old city. And then it happens that there's a river right in the middle of the city so our building, our art museum, eventually became a bridge. And the uh, there's a donor who is an artist, liked the idea, and the city also liked the idea, because uh, nobody also uh, owns the uh, the land over the river, so city uh, can can uh, actually use it without uh, uh, much cost. 
And then here you can see we plugged our new museum into the existing old fabric. And then so it looks like this. And and it, it's not really a traditional in forms. Again, the materials you will see some are uh, we use are, are rather traditional and, and very local. So it's part of the fabric. And also it does somehow trying to, to do a, a new or contemporary version of the covered bridge in the region. So it is a covered bridge. Here's a diagram. So you see the pedestrian bridge built in uh, steel because it would allow the maximum amount of uh, flat water to go through. And the, the, the steel place would actually cut the tree branches and so on in the water. And then you see a concrete bridge for a painting gallery. You see a big exhibition how you embrace the painting bridge and then connects the two levels. So all together, three levels. So and as you can see in this photograph, and this is uh, the uh, pedestrian bridge, so people can can cross it for for going uh, whatever they do, uh, uh, such as to work, to to take kids to school, to shop. However, on the bridge, even they don't want to, uh, didn't plan to go into the uh, uh, art museum. We opened two uh, big skylights so that they could have a glimpse of uh, the artwork inside. The big exhibition hall and the painting gallery within the concrete bridge. And you can see how the building is situated in the context from the street level. There are two entrances, uh, of course, one on each side of the river bank. And uh, this is a, another uh, side of the river. So that's when you go into the museum on one side because of the elevation change. So there's a staircase to go into the painting gallery and then you can get down from the painting gallery to the, the big exhibition hall. Traditional tile is used as brisole on the uh, elevation. And then uh, it's a kind of a stone wash uh, a surface. Um, it's very uh, common in, in China. This use uh, pebble stones from the river. And then uh, of course, uh, again, uh, it's a building which is old and new at the same time. Some people thought the building were there uh, all along. That was the uh, best compliments uh, we, we got for the project. So um, this is uh, the last architectural project I'm gonna show. As you can uh, see, uh, our ambition has no end. We also asked the question, could we design or could we build city? City, uh, as we know, is uh, a, a very complex uh, uh, thing to uh, be designed. What we did is this, we say, well, maybe we can't design every single aspect of a city, but we could design maybe uh, one thing or two. So the one thing we did is that we designed the size of the block. You may not able to uh, tell from uh, this drawing, the typical block here is only 40 by 40 meters in China, in new cities, the uh, convention si conventional size of a block starts from five by 500 meters. So it is uh, tiny uh, for China. In the uh, United States, there is one city where you can see uh, small blocks of that size, which is uh, actually Portland, uh, Oregon. So, and then we studied how we could organize the space of a small 
block like these with a central courtyard of uh, various uh, forms. And then that's how uh, the uh, we we planned a lot lot bigger area, and that's the the uh, I don't remember the number twenty four uh, blocks. We we uh, our office designed, and that's how it looks from the sky. And then you can see uh, the ten meter wide street. The standard uh, the the typical block would be about. 40 by 40 meters and with a 10 meter wide street and courtyards in different forms. On your left, there are four little blocks with a floating uh, hotel on top, which makes a rain. And then uh, you see all these buildings are five stories in height. So the four, and then of course, we're getting closer, closer. The whole point is not just making the block smaller for the sake of doing so or making something small because all the other cities have a, a huge uh, super blocks as they call them. The whole point is to make a place more livable for people, not for cars. And then you can see this is actually a, a street for cars the street would bend a little like a shared street in, uh, you know, in Holland. And then of course, pedestrian streets, covered walkways under, on the first, on the ground floor of every single building. It's, it's like a, an arcade. And then people already uh, have started to move in. So, and then buildings uh, would have uh, different forms and spatial organizations, although the uh, structural systems and of course, uh, and, and uh, their, their sizes are, are the same. And then in each building, uh, we call them actually block building, you see courtyards. And this is uh, just uh, an interior space has not yet uh, finished. So anyway, and this is a detail of one of the buildings where you see uh, after all, you know, after all these years and uh, after all these projects, we're still just uh, um, uh, putting uh, two pieces of bricks together and 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 uh, uh, perhaps uh, it really tells us uh, what architecture is about. But I'm not finished yet because I thought in order to give you a, a better idea of our office, FCJZ as a practice, I have to show you something more than buildings. So we uh, actually keep on building other things our installations, we made these uh, um, you know, viewfinders to look for these pieces, actually uh, as a homage to uh, the uh, Russian artist Malovich. But however, audience enjoy them very much, not only uh, to see uh, the artwork, but also to see themselves taking selfies. And we design furniture, bent wood furniture. One piece of plywood bent twice in this case. And then there's a, some flex in there. Um, it's like they, they say uh, in, in German, uh, a fry swinger. And, and then um, more of that. And we design interiors and with, uh, uh, furniture is designed by ourselves. A big table can be put together and change their organizations and so on. We designed a little push card for, this is a cake shop. So cake, breads and ice creams is a place that I would love to go all the time. And then we uh, use uh, a CNC machine uh, to uh, 
carve a piece of a formica surreal a particular material produced by formica to create translucency. It looks like rice paper, but actually it's uh, made of a man-made stone. And then we do actually clothing design. This is a, a, a dress, as you can see, it's two dimensional cut in front and three dimensional cut in the back. Stage costume and stage. And we do a dinnerware. We design you know, plates and pans and pots where we're doing cups right now, bottles for vinegar and, and olive oil. And I slow down just a bit. This is a piece of cake. It's called Napoleon cake, or mie fouille in, in uh, French. Uh, it's something I really like. Uh, this I didn't design, but I, I, as an architect, I just couldn't help to notice two problems with a cake. Because as you can see, uh, the way it's layered, the uh, moisture in the cream would get into the pastry. It's very crisp so that you can't really share it. You never could have uh, uh, a, a birthday with uh, uh, the, uh, the the Napoleon. So when I redesigned it, I, I used my knowledge as an architect. So I had a, a the cream put in a, a swimming pool made of uh, chocolate, and put the pastry aside so it can be shared. And of course, now it's waterproofed, so that uh, you can take a piece of the pastry and then dip it uh, in the uh, in the cream. So to finish up, this is our uh, uh, ongoing um, non-architectural uh, architectural project. Uh, it's, a, it's a carpet, that's pastry. Uh, it's gonna be a 1.2 meter square. So anyway, I probably drag on for too long. So you, you have some idea what do we do. Thank you, everyone, very, very much. Yeah. Young Ho, if we were um, if we were on campus, and I don't know if you've ever uh, visited RPI in the past. No, I would love to. I want to see one of the oldest architecture schools in the U.S. Well, but, yeah. Um, yeah. Once once we find a, a vaccine, uh, I will extend an invitation right away. Okay. <clears throat> So I me a ticket and the vaccine. I'm coming. Okay, that's that's wonderful. Now, the reason why I brought it up is is because uh, if we were uh, there's a great building by Nicholas Grimshaw within which we have our lectures. It's called the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center. And I I uh, assure you there would have been a standing ovation uh, after your presentation. So I I know that one of the outcomes. Uh, of uh, of the pandemic and presentations online is that after uh, presenting extraordinary work, which you have, and I, I want to applaud you on the on the highest level, uh, the silence uh, can be deafening. Uh, but but be assured that it it it's uh, no indication of uh, there's no lack of appreciation and respect for what you just shared with us. Um, Wow, it's it's uh, it's a tour de force. Uh, most of this work I had known; uh, some of it I haven't. And there's a lot to talk about. So uh, before we we kind of let's let's talk a little bit about how we want to structure this. I I thought I would uh, open up uh, a conversation with you. I have a, I have a series of questions for you, uh, and then at some moment we'll open it up to our audience. Uh, comprised of students and faculty. So I'm going to I'm going to pull uh, back a, a bit from the work, which I can't wait to talk about, only because um, I think in your particular case, and I mentioned this in my uh, uh, opening introduction, uh, your own uh, history and upbringing uh, has probably had a, a profound 
uh, impact on 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 the way you think about the world uh, and how uh, you structure your practice uh, conceptually and philosophically and even artistically. Um, from my understanding, uh, uh, based on uh, my uh, you know the effort looking into your background, your your father was a chief architect uh, for the Communist Party. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, and I'm sure, uh, like any great mentor, uh, he's left a, a, a deep and resounding impression. But so did that uh, time in the history of China, and and like one of your projects, which was the bridge, uh, your very um, journey uh, in your life has crossed these. Uh, rather uh, complex and um, profound uh, ideological and, and political terrains. So I'm curious in any way that you would you would like to talk about it. Could you tell us a, a little more about the influence that your father uh, had on you and and how it's contributed to the architect and person you are today? Um. See if I can make a, a long story <laughs> short. Um, well, first of all, uh, my father, uh, as you mentioned, was uh, the chief architect of the uh, uh, the the Design Institute of Beijing, and and uh, before the Cultural Revolution, he was most active. He designed the. Uh, History Museum of China on the uh, Tiananmen Square, and for instance, and, uh, and and quite a few other uh, civic buildings, the Planetarium of uh, Beijing, and and so on. However, um, he uh, he and my mom they decided that they didn't want to impose too much on us. Well, I have a brother. So we were, uh, is that the term of free ranch chickens? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, we, they gave us really a free hand and uh, uh, we, uh, and we, we had fun. And it's not like, you know, the Chinese, uh, uh, typical Chinese kids, they study all the time. And so uh, we were almost the opposite. We, you know, we went swimming and in the summer skating uh, in the winter, however, um somehow uh, my dad would uh would uh he loved art there was only one book about mm -hmm. world art he uh, borrowed from a friend but uh, in english and he he uh, knew english very well he would uh, tell the stories of these paintings to my brother and i just you know just for fun yeah and he would yeah. Show up and go and say, "What the heck is this? I I don't understand." And and so I said, "You know, it's not. so we we thought it was fun. No, no, we would laugh with him and with self portrait of Van Gogh and so on. And now, of course, um, I uh, really appreciated that today. And so basically, he offered uh, opportunity for us. To love something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that was very important. So my talk today, hopefully, mm -hmm. I offered uh, the opportunity for the students to maybe love architecture a little more, however difficult uh, you know it is to be an architect. So and then, and also you can see uh, the uh, general atmosphere during the late 60s and 70s, during the Cultural Revolution, was so different from what we had uh, at home. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so, so that's my uh, upbringing. And uh, uh, only until the end of the Cultural Revolution, uh, I was, the, the colleges reopened, my brother and I, was very uh, um, anxious to get in, and I wanted to study art because of the uh, right. the influence right. I had. But uh, my paintings were 
so loudly that I had no chance. <laughs> so my father at that point uh, said, why don't you consider what I do? So architecture doesn't require you to be a great artist. Also, you don't have to be good with math and uh, physics and so So that would have worked well for you. And then uh, I, uh, the only time kind of uh, I listened to him as, you know, the, the, he's a fatherly uh, advice. So I studied architecture. Uh, uh, Young Ho was given the political climate during his career. Uh, was it unstated that that um, one's kind of individual uh, 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 expression as an architect needed to be uh, tempered? In in favor of of a certain kind of uh, iconography or stylistic tendencies. Yes, yes, there were uh, mostly uh, two uh, stages, and uh, he uh, experienced early on was fairly simple. It was uh, something that uh, would uh, would uh, 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 you know express. Uh, the Chinese culture to some extent, yes. but mostly something basic economical and and and, and of uh, of uh, uh, so it's, it's basically the kind of uh, 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 I was thinking the the term so it's uh, it's cheap sounds and uh, aesthetically pleasing, if possible, <laughs> follow that doctrine. Right. Which right. I have to say, that's kind of okay. You know, it's, uh, and then however, later on, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Soviet I influence came in, and then they were Soviets uh, literally working in China with the local architects, sort of forcing them to do the socialist, uh, uh, realist uh, kind of architecture. Right. And that was, uh, uh, that was pretty terrible anyway. <laughs> and, and how are those buildings uh, perceived today by your generation? Well, we have a, a very uh, mixed feeling. Uh, mixed because, uh, um, of course, uh, especially as a son of uh, an architect from that generation, um, we, I felt uh, my father, uh, say my father's talents were kind of wasted because they had to do that kind of work. But yet there were certain quality in those buildings. Yes. And yes. we kind of, uh, in my case, I didn't get to go to the United States uh, uh, and you're much later. So I, I get a sense of Western classicism, classicism through those buildings. So there, there were certain qualities and uh, spatially, formally, and, uh, in, and uh, in terms of use of materials and so on. And uh, uh, I, I don't think we can say uh, they were bad. Mm -hmm. Actually, the vulgar buildings, we're uh -huh. built after the marketing economy <laughs> kicked in. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. But no, anyway, it, no. But it's it, it's interesting because um, uh, I'm thinking of Newly Map. I'm thinking of of your bookcase behind you. That that uh, cities, in fact, are like books, and irrespective yeah. of taste and and uh, judgment. Uh, of the quality, they they actually uh, are in indexes of the cultural moment of that time. Yeah, so, right. And they contribute uh, to the city in so far as they they have a certain uh, they project some truth about the world, and uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, China at that moment in time. So. Thank you. Uh, that was insightful. We fast forward. You uh, you move forward uh, in your career. You you travel to the states, and uh, you receive your uh, undergraduate 
and your uh, graduate degree uh, in the States. And, um, and then you come back and, you know, condensing this kind of wonderful journey because you were the chair uh, of, uh, of the graduate program at MIT, one of the finest architecture programs in the world. So you you have this kind of unique opportunity where you you have traversed the east and the west. Uh, there's something wonderfully poignant about the fact that that you come from a family of a great architect, and 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 then you are in the middle of this kind of western storm, which has its own kind of ideological and design bias, and and you come home. So, in a certain way, you're you're a product of two worlds, and 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 that's not necessarily a problem. There's something uh, uh, profoundly interesting about that, because as the world has uh, become globalized and and uh, borders and boundaries have have collapsed, uh, there's there's a greater flow of, of an exchange of information and and, and knowledge, uh, and and yet. Given the fact that you're in this between world, as I mentioned earlier, you you've attempted to kind of reinterpret the cultural legacy of China in in, in a rather uh, unique and novel way. So could could you speak about um, that phenomenon? Um, I, I have to uh, first of all, I w wanted to uh, uh, see that. Can you know give give everyone uh, uh, runs later uh, some idea um, how uh, uh, I was educated because uh, I grew up uh, you know my early days right when uh, the Great Cultural Revolution broke out in in 1966. When I was ten years old, you know, I was uh, a third grade um, kid, and then uh, it really uh, it was a huge problem for me, uh, which I only realized later on because I miss out the learning of the, uh, uh, the 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 Chinese classics. Uh, along with uh, uh, Chinese arts and so on. Mm -hmm. They were all considered as uh, part of the so-called four O's, right? You know, so, uh, so, and then, so I, all my generation, I still have trouble, big trouble reading an ancient Chinese. I can, you know, I can use uh, modern Chinese fine, but uh, to read ancient Chinese, uh, it, it's, it's impossible. However, the funny part now is that I, I do want to understand, say, old Chinese philosophy, right? But I, I can't really read the uh, the uh, the uh, originals. So I had to, uh, uh, for instance, I there there's a French philosopher. His name is Francois Julian. Julian, he, uh, he, he, uh, he, of course, he's a chi Chinese uh, uh, philosophy uh, expert. He, he could uh, interpret the, the Chinese ideas uh, very well into, uh, into a French. So, and then, so now the way for me to learn Chinese philosophy is how Chinese philosophy first interpreted <laughs> by Julian, and then uh, Julian's writing translated into English, and then from English <laughs> back to Chinese, and then I got the idea. Wow, uh, <laughs> it's quite a detour, yes. but it's kind of a it's kind of a okay. Uh, because uh, you know, I am who I am, I can't change my background, but uh, I, I can use or rather take advantage of my background in such a way that maybe get something little different, sometimes a little more. So the whole idea of designing time came from ancient China 
we we uh, we uh, Francois Julien. Right, right. It, it, it's it's kind of interesting because uh, maybe there. Uh, I I love the story because it 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 speaks about a world that's uh, uh, created out of out of circles, uh, orbits, and that uh, knowledge. You know, it's like translating poetry. There's no perfect equivalency in another language, but it it does challenge uh, the interpreter maybe to dig deeper in terms of identifying the underlying meaning and the importance of conveying that meaning in a different context. So I, I would use that as an analogy to a, a number of the projects that you presented today, uh, which either faced uh, a historical context directly, um, uh, as in the case of the project, which it had uh, historic preservation, and and there were different, um, let's say, uh, terms of engagement. Uh, some of them were light touches, some of them were medium, and some uh, had to create new buildings like like contemporary ghosts. Uh, but you were looking for a conversation to take place across time. Yes. And and you and and I think you have said this in something I read prior to this lecture that I'm, you were you were uh, somewhat critical of of uh, certain architects that were too e easily recreating the iconography of the past uh literally without understanding the larger cultural and uh and philosophical motivations of it so it it what's so beautiful about your practice is that you're continually looking at at how to uh, recover reclaim something of great value that's behind you but bring it forward to a contemporary audience and i don't think yes. that's easy to do and and quite honestly i'm speaking from the us and america where there's such a short history i don't think many architects understand how to do that in 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 the us well, um, you know, I, I think U.S. has a, 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 well, the history of the U.S. may not be that long, but interestingly, like, you know, the time I spent in Boston, I, I, I actually saw a lot more uh, older buildings in, in uh, a city like Boston. And and uh, so may not be the good w w word. You know, we 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 were in buildings easily twenty. I'm uh, sorry, twenty two, two hundred years old. Yeah. yeah. So that uh, it's that living history for me. Uh, however uh, short it might be, uh, but it's actually uh, there so that uh, architects can can understand them in a very direct way the problem in china is much of the country has been rebuilt god knows how many times through the history so that understanding time becomes often a very uh, uh, abstract exercise so that actually is difficult for instance we won a competition uh, about 10 days ago they say two weeks ago uh, is to extend a temple uh, in the city of Hangzhou, right. which right. is 1,700 years old. Wow. wow. It's, you know, it's, it, it was initially established by Indian monks you know, way, way back, right? However, on site, all the buildings there, we, you know, we, we could, we could, uh, see and touch were built no more than a hundred years. So right. it's to <clears throat> looking at these newer buildings, not actually very well built, but to understand this much longer history uh, of this temple. So we were looking for uh, so uh, to hints and clues not so much in the uh, uh, in the uh, architecture there, but 
on the site, in the rocks, in the in the uh, just incredible uh, big trees and so on. So the sense of time uh, <laughs> we would have to build, otherwise we can't uh, really design the extension. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, of course and in the end, however uh, challenging it might be, it, it's uh, very interesting. It, it's something uh, uh, in uh, it's deliberately uh, uh, done by by us. Otherwise, often that the uh, the uh, notion of time could be so abstract, uh, it, it's uh, kind of a meaningless. No, it's it, and it's a really really um, important topic to discuss, uh, especially for um, a student in the School of Architecture, where there's there's probably um, a disproportionate amount of emphasis on the kind of um, uh, retinal exuberance of mm. plan sections and elevations. There's, there's uh, uh, you know, the for those that are entering into architecture, and and they're unfamiliar with the the syntax of architecture. Just uh, being able to adequately draw a plan section elevation and recognize that that these are kind of singular uh, profile portraits of something that's three dimensional. That's a that's a kind of radical initiation. And so probably what from my experience as an educator, what happens is that they become uh, even unconsciously enamored with the way things look, and and with with based on uh, the the belief that that they have to be interesting and somewhat seductive uh, to uh, reach a level of of um, kind of design excellence. And in contrast, and I'll I'll uh, as an example, and I'm sure you could you would agree with me if you go see Khan's work like the Exeter library and you yes. I mean what what a what a um, an insight into the mysteries of architecture and uh, the inability for certain representational syst systems to capture certain information in architecture that if you look at his plan sections and elevations in a of course, we all think they're exquisite uh, as as uh, people, uh, architects who, and educators who've been in the profession a long time. But maybe someone younger, a, a bit a bit more novice, m might bypass or dismiss those drawings quickly. But if you go to the Exeter Library, like the like many of his projects, you're you're blown away on the most profound level in terms of how. Uh, sophisticated uh, the ideas and the dimensions and uh, the design considerations that are found within the space-time construct of his buildings. Um, and so it, it, it's interesting how architecture gets is received. Most of it is received through images. Um, uh, it, we, we don't often uh, see the masterworks in person, so it's a it's it's really uh, I thought really poignant and timely in a, in a world and an era of speed and proliferation that that you would talk about time something that is difficult quite honestly to measure and to capture and, and to regulate as an architect and I thought the the example of of the zigzag bridge footbridge the kind of stepping stone path was was wonderful because it it actually lived simultaneously between a Malevich or a Lizitsky, right, as an image. And at the same time, it was very much embedded into this larger kind of metaphysical understanding of time. So I'm I'm curious on that note after you know, it's a long preface. Um, do, do you are are you conscious of the fact that you're constantly moving back and forth between certain compositional considerations that are found in the drawings arrived at um, in contrast to a more phenomenological approach and it's highlighted by your 
your comments in some of the earlier projects tonight where you spoke about the one and two point perspective. Obviously, you're, you were putting the, the eye of the occupant as a major point of reference. Those are two very different domains from which to generate architecture. And I'm not suggesting they're diametrically opposed, but I'd be curious about what you think of that. Um, <laughs> it's not an easy uh, uh, question to answer, but because uh, uh, there, there are uh, several sides uh, to the question. Um, again, uh, maybe I, uh, I, I should give you a little bit more about my, my uh, um, educational background. So when I entered the architecture school in China, right after the Cultural Revolution in 19, uh, at that time was uh, uh, 78. The school, it's the same school my father went to. Uh, it's the school in Nanjing. Uh, they taught us still classicism, but without the classical forms, uh -huh. if you can imagine. So the 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 idea uh the doctrine of, of uh, uh classicism um it really uh, is something that uh not only that i i got it and i i, I developed quite an interest namely uh the uh, the perspective because we had to at that time construct perspectives such as with uh, t square and triangles right, right. and uh, and then of course my my interest in art i kind of uh, uh also uh later discover how in in the uh, 15th century in in italy and the mathematic uh, uh, perspective were were invented and and so on so i'm just saying that my my kind of a kind of a uh it's kind of a classical training i had is part of me right, right. And, and then uh, i uh, uh i can't get rid of it and i don't want to <laughs> so that gives me a, a rather uh a, a limited uh, uh kind of a hand to to uh to deal with some of the things. And then on the other hand, you know, I had a Malovich in, in my uh, uh, talk and I didn't talk about John Haydock. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and there's a lot, lot of artists and architects wh whose work probably would have considered as the classic modern. It, it, it's on, uh, on, on another side of me. And I feel, now that I feel I like the work, I feel they already have become a uh, part of me too. Uh, so for instance, when I talk about me, I'm not thinking of the, the, this German fellow who worked in, uh, started probably in 1920s and came to the US and none of that. I just thought he's someone I could understand, first of all, as an architect. Secondly, as a human being, I right, read a right. bit about about his, uh, you know, biography and so on, and, and I felt uh, there's an understanding I share um, with him. So with that, uh, and uh, also, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm 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 living in this globalized world like everyone else but also i'm, I'm very much uh, uh, kind of a uh, uh, um influenced by things happening around me my my years at mit uh they were also in a way uh, uh problematic because uh, i i was distracted by all this fantastic technology, uh -huh. I found very interesting. Not that I don't, I didn't care for. I, I I'm only in my my Renaissance uh, one point perspective, maybe with uh, 
uh, misinforms. So within all of that, so every project is about creating a, somehow a balance. Of course, also the uh, the Chinese uh, uh, philosophy and Chinese aesthetics and uh, and and poetry and so on. So so it's uh, I only say it's often that the work probably uh, turn out uh, kind of uh, contradictory uh, in terms of uh, these different uh, sides. But yet some other time uh, I could uh, possibly uh, create a balance of them. You can see the work in a way uh, uh, reflects an architect probably uh, at peace with himself. <laughs> <laughs> It's horrible like that. So I, uh, it, uh, you know, it changes all the time. I, I, uh, there's one thing I'm quite sure itself again is a contradiction. I have very, very uh, clumsy uh, hands. I, I can't make things. Um, I, I, I can't draw, but not as well as like my father and and, and others. However, I feel I have an understanding of builder architects better than the other kind, right. better than right. the conceptual ones. So from me, you know, all the architects I like very much are sort of a builder architects. Yeah, I mean, so I'm trying to be one, but without really no. Uh, well, you're, no you're being one. tremendously. Yeah. Uh, uh, modest. Uh, first, I would say that although you you were thinking of going into the uh, the art profession and uh, you decided for a variety of reasons that maybe you'd be a better architect, your your creativity and 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 of course I would I, I we say this to our students all the time it it can extend into uh, a range of media and it 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 finds its voice through the language that it's confronted with. And you're very much uh, uh, the, the artist you originally intended to be uh, w within the profile of an architect because there's a kind of uh, profound curiosity and imagination. And I would argue even a kind of um, open play you you use the term contradiction, and I was going to I was going to bring that up because I it, it, uh, maybe the uh, interesting analogy uh, your practice is is a little bit like jazz, <laughs> and 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 that's a compliment. In, in other words, uh, if 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 jazz, and this is an oversimplification, if if jazz is a, is a kind of intended critique. In relation to classical music, it, it's it's about inflecting rules, and and um, uh, celebrating a kind of improvisational condition. Then there are a number of examples of work you show today where uh, there were typological inversions. You 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 uh, showed us the Farnsworth House. Uh, uh, and it and it starts off with with the glass being a kind of infinite expanse uh, to the world and, and certainly to the natural context beyond. And yet, when you uh, rotate that type and turn it into tower, and you put the glass as a har horizontal floors, uh, what's interesting is that you did, the building detaches itself momentarily from the city. And the 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 infinite moves along the vertical axis to the ground and the sky. It's a kind of beautiful uh, inflection on that original inheritance. You you read it in 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 a rather unusual way, uh, Young Ho, and I, like no one's ever done before. And I thought it was kind of beautiful. And then I. I've read your your uh, writings on uh, was it uh, uh, micro urbanism? Yeah. Right. Um, yes. Uh, and smallness and 
the idea of changing a city out of incremental adjustments or modifications. And yet, if they were theoretically to proliferate, you could change the city from the bottom up. Um, so uh, I'm looking at that, at, at the vertical house. And what was the name of that house, by the way? Uh, vertical glass house. The vertical glass house. That vertical <laughs> glass house, it's interesting that you can be in the city and out of the city simultaneously, whereas um, the last project you spoke about was more explicitly about uh, urban life uh, with the canopies and the vistas and trying to activate the ground plane. In other words, it's yes. it's more directly uh, uh, and explicitly targeting tactics in the city that could revitalize uh, the contemporary city. So it seems to me you come the, the, there's a common uh, agenda, but you come at it from many different ways. The the four or five houses you showed, which uh, if we had more time, you'd probably speak about your influence from John Haydick. They speak about a kind of uh, a private a private universe, right within that very small contained space called the house is this extraordinary constellation of ideas and and and, and uh, abstract ideas right mm. so yeah no it's it, it, it it's interesting I, I i i i love i love trying to kind of reread your work and try to understand whether there's a where there's uh, consistency and where those contradictions kind of open up a new place, a new horizon for you. And it appears that it has. Um, uh, maybe I can uh, uh, offer you uh, uh, so something that I don't know if you, I think you, you, you may know already. So for the uh, vertical glass house, when I drew it, you know, I wasn't really practicing, right? is in the in, uh, uh, early 90s. So when I drew a house like this, however, uh, you know, I, I don't, not I, I didn't know it's gonna be, uh, uh, when it's gonna be built. I thought it will not ever be built, right, really. But anyway, I still thought, who's gonna want to live in, in a house like that? Uh -huh. if, if, if I would ever get a client, to right? I, because I thought, uh, you know, I, I would try. And, and actually, in reality, my wife and I were the first people uh, living, living in the house uh, for a few nights. So anyway, so, so, I, so the house has to do with, with uh, you know, the whole modern tradition of glass house, of course, is from the West. And, and then... So I, I, I was going through my mind and re, you know, in my readings, sort of searching for an ideal client. I actually found one. It's, it's real, but the person lived in third century China, a, a, a thinker, a philosopher, who's mostly famous now today for saying, uh, the sky and the earth is my architecture, and the building is my clothes. Because he uh, he always stayed naked at home. Uh -huh. He's, he was very poor. He had one robe. He put it on one hand when he went out, took it off when he came back. But he made it into a philosophy. So I thought that guy, uh, his name is Liu Ling. So right. he would be perfect. Right. So in a way, I, I was thinking of modern architecture in the in a sort of a Western language. Yet I found a client who's a third-century Chinese thinker. So uh, yeah, that's how it works. So it, it doesn't it doesn't bother me at all because that's me. But yet sometimes uh, it, it's sort of a to. To be coherent is really not that easy. No, no, it may be, but the, the the lack of coherence rep might signify a different form of intelligence. 
Is that house uh, being used as an artist residency now? Yes, it's, it's a guest house. There's problem with, with the plumbing and so on, but yet uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, our client uses it that way. But they 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 were all along hoping a hotel next door would eventually take over the management. They they're they're you know they can't really, even if this one room, but they they yeah they use it from time to time. Well, listen, all the projects were beautiful. Why don't we we open it now to uh, uh, the students and even the faculty? Uh, if if anyone uh, has a question, uh, they would like to uh, ask uh, Professor Cheng. Uh, feel free to put that uh, in the question and answer. And, and just uh, uh, be reminded everyone, and I'm speaking to the school now, if they, if you don't, I I can certainly continue this conversation, but there's an opportunity to, to, to raise a, a question, an idea that you think is important. Hey, Robert, if you're listening, do you see anything in the chat box? Robert Wilson. Young Ho, I'll. I'll um, no, yeah. I'm not seeing anything in there right now. Okay. Oh, I just maybe I'll have a few more questions for you, Young Ho, because it's okay. exciting Please. to be able to speak to you. Um, I, I mean, they're all exceptional projects. The the Bridge Museum. It is a masterpiece. Uh, I, I would imagine that, that that's been enormously, uh, well, it's highly respected, but appreciated by many people in the community on both sides of, of, uh, of the river, uh, because it, it, it constitutes, it, it's a kind of hybridized program. It's, it's, it's both a kind of standard uh, pass through to move from one part of the city to the next, but it's it's also a a destination and one that is specifically offering culture and art to the community. I mean, it there's something beautifully uh, innovative about it as a new type, as a new program, um, and although it's it's one project, it seems to me that it it has the the uh, capacity to be replicated, and I'm only talking about its program, not its its architectural design, uh, anywhere in the country. Mm. Yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, well, see, for me, um, we have actually, well, it's actually, I have to use a word. Uh, I think in China, uh, we, we actually don't talk about it as much as uh, the US. See, for me, uh, infrastructure right. uh, is it, a thing that um, in, in almost anywhere in the world, uh, today still, mo in most cases, you see it as a, a separate entity from the other uh, building blocks of, of the city. But uh, in fact, uh, you know, we may say uh, in a, a school of architecture, of course it's part of architecture, or the other way around. If the whole city can be perceived as infrastructure and the architecture is of course part of uh, that, right? It's, so for me, the 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 thing really can uh, uh, may, maybe uh, uh, to to uh, be kind of uh, extended and to be uh, uh, experimented more is how architecture and the infrastructure kind of uh, uh, being combined. So 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 I, I, I had an interview once about that building and. The, People ask exactly the same question you asked. So I, the simple 
answer is yes, but I think the important thing for me, if a bridge and an art museum can be put together, could we put together uh, something else? I don't have a good idea right now, but it may, maybe uh, say uh, a grocery store uh, and and uh, uh, um, uh, well, a community center. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So, for instance, we just finished. Uh, a very small project. It's less than 200 square meters. It's a bakery. It's an interior design. But we turned the bakery into a community center so that uh, the bakery would have a, a better business, but also for that neighborhood, they would have a place to get together for birthday party, for for whatever you know, the, it, 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 our design has this kind of a communal quality to it. There's a huge uh, table actually. It's in the, uh, uh, it, it, in the I didn't talk about it. It's in, in the slideshow. So anyway, so so that's an, an important idea. I I love to see it to uh, to be uh, you know taken on by other by other architects and, and do something about it. You know, it occurs to me that um, that the that the work operates obviously on a on a variety of levels simultaneously, but there are ideas or rules or regulations or even codes codes of thought that operate uh, at a kind of meta level, and then when you're given a a, a real commission those get uh, charged with, you know, the, the language of architecture and the, your, your love and appreciation for construction and craft and materials. And, and they become physical embodiments of these conceptual aspirations. In, in many parts of the world, uh, and you probably know this more than I do, there are city, city architects or there, there is an architect or group of architects that that are charged with with writing the rules and regulations for the city. Mm. Assuming you get a real poet <laughs> in, in a position of influence like that, like yourself, th then you, th this individual or this group can transform the city by not necessarily designing the buildings or the infrastructure, but designing the, the playing field and, and, and the rules of engagement, whether we're talking- To program the city. Yeah, to program the city. And, and I thought, you know, uh, the, the, the school that you designed, uh, you, you spoke about it in two parallel terms. You spoke about it as an, as an architect designing a curriculum and a curriculum designing the architecture. In other words, the, the, the building uh, was, had a kind of pedagogical agenda. And then inside the building, there, there really was a foundation course where everyone had to make something with their hands. And, and that beautiful slippage, I mean, it, 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 it's kind of, uh, it exemplifies your life because you, you've been uh, an educator and a practitioner, and there's probably a, a reciprocity that's been going on for many decades. But I'm just, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about how you as a single entity author, some of your ideas are so, um, how should I say it? They're so ambitious in so far as they could take on the scale of entire cities. And it doesn't mean that you're you're interested in the authorship of those buildings. You're interested in the behavior of how cities are conceived in order to activate or fulfill their full potential. And maybe I'm uh, wishing a future for you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, 
I think a real city would would be a, a a challenge. However, again, hard. I would love to take on. But the interesting thing about what you uh, were uh, you were talking about is how uh, an architect uh, could uh, could uh, maybe eventually uh, or, or just by chance to uh, to 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 sell a, a kind of more outlandish idea, put it that way. It's actually, uh, it's, if anyone is kind of curious about that, it's super simple. The way I do it, uh, it I, I just let the client know uh, what I'm thinking. Often, my idea, of course, uh, were uh, rejected uh, or <laughs> ignored. I, I'm just keep trying. There's a project I didn't show because last attempt again failed. When I was a student at Ball State University in, in Muncie, Indiana, right. in the early right. 80s, I had a, a teacher from AA. His name is Rodney Place. He's a, he's a, a South African uh, English person, yes. and uh, you know, with with his uh, you know uh, guidance, I I designed uh, an apartment building where everyone could uh, ride their bicycle through the entire complex. So that idea, you know, that's that was in a eighty two nineteen eighty two. Kind of just just got stuck there uh, all my life, and then how many times now I I try to sell that idea to a client, and then the last time it was uh, a shopping, it's, it's not that small actually. It's say because it doesn't have floors. It's it's about a three story uh, shop shopping uh, complex uh, where people can can ride bicycles all the way through and uh, um, the client accepted the idea because he he's he's inside it uh, sort of extreme sports and uh, uh -huh. skateboarding and all of that and uh, so the idea of uh, biking is pretty uh, comfortable comfortable for him and and then we we have done already a DD in you know, a design development, uh, and then he lost the land. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, so. We'll see. You know, city or some of these ideas. Uh, we we yeah. just keep pushing. We keep trying. So you know, uh, well, uh, you never know. You never know. It's very it's very impressive. So the students are starting to ask questions. Uh, here we go. After being a prominent architect in two major countries, uh, he's referring to you. Are there any major differences in how Americans perform the process of design or construction versus uh, those in China? Um, right now, the uh, the difference between uh, uh, architectural practice as well as education, I have to say. Oh, rather than that the gap is getting smaller. Um, I, I I see it actually is not a good thing. I, I see it almost uh, uh, as a, an issue because these this trend, uh, this kind of a professionalization of architecture, however needed, uh, as we all all know. It is separating the architects from the construction. So the title of my talk is probably mundane for some building. It's actually it's a carefully chosen word. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's that's what my my practice is about, and that's how I understand the whole thing. Um, so uh, now we have we have codes. Some of the codes are pretty much uh, based on the American codes, and uh, we have uh, the licensing system. I have uh, we we have more uh, uh, steel uh, structures 
and then before although the majorities are are, are concrete uh, buildings so yes uh, there's some difference but not as much as uh, say 20 years ago right right um thank you um here's a, a question from uh, douglas tang uh, have you ever thought about redesigning the ice cream sandwich uh, just kidding <laughs> Uh, maybe I missed it, uh, uh, but do you take inspiration from your father's works despite it originating from the cultural revolution? I remember you said it was redeemable qualities, but I don't think you talked about those qualities. Uh, well, it, it's, it's, I'm just saying that, uh, actually that's something, uh, I, I don't really want to talk about politics, not only uh, yeah. Yeah. because I'm not good at at it, but it, it's, what I experienced was that a discipline, a body of knowledge like architecture would would have uh, its, its own core. That's something we care all the time. And, and, and so for that reason, Actually, for me, I, I even developed a different understanding, not different, you know, different from the, the typical Western uh, approach, but it's not that different from the traditional Chinese approach, is to, to see a continuous uh, um, kind of a, a undivided time, put it that way. Right. So, so, right. so meaning that I, I, you know, it sounds like you, you appreciate uh, also uh, uh, Western classical music, yes. I assume. Yeah, of course. Uh, I do. Yeah. I, I do very much. Uh, I, uh, uh, for, for instance, I, I listen to uh, Goldberg variations by, by different pianists and all the time. Uh, so when I listen, it's, this is sort of a really long answer. So when I listen to uh, uh, Goldberg variations, I'm not thinking this German guy who works in a church with uh -huh. probably 10 kids, I don't remember Bach's uh, life story, and, and made a piece of uh, music uh, just for his era. But right. for me, I'm listening to music. I yes. feel yes. like he wrote it for me, someone in China <laughs> 300 years later. And so the, at that moment is not, there is no time lapse, but rather I think time continues. So back to the cultural revolution, the trauma, the tragedy of cultural revolution is part of the country, is part of my family. There's no doubt about it. It's just uh, it's not gonna go away. But mm -hmm. however, even during the Cultural Revolution, there are moments, and then with architecture, I have to say, all the architecture I appreciate more, uh, the Chinese architecture, were built before that period. But during that period, there, there were some kind of a uh, uh, you know, the use of uh, political icons. It's not terribly interesting, uh, yeah, yeah. but yet they were buildings. If if I can strip them off those things, uh, the the red banners and whatever, I still can can discover something. So that uh, say uh, 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 the uh, the Roman Colosseum probably is not politi politically correct. Yes, today. Yeah. But we you know that's a tremendous piece of architecture. You no, know, no, we but we can we can see through those and discover the virtues in architecture uh, there. And then I can do that too uh, in uh, in in uh, uh, for for even architecture during the Cultural Revolution. There's one type of uh, architecture in particular is the most probably under-designed, uh, but yet because of that, there are the most 
straightforward, honest buildings, the industrial buildings. Right. I, right. Yeah, I, I, so we are renovating a building, building uh, way after Cultural Revolution, but uh, it's sort of of that quality. It's actually the, the, the construction quality uh, it's poor, um, but uh, we are still trying to save as much as we, we can. Although it gets, again, uh, uh, I would say contradictory. I like the light, lightness of the steel truss on that building. Um, so we, we in our design, you know, it, it, it was all about saving those trusses, but in reality, they don't meet the standards of today's uh, structural codes, right. so we had to redo them. <laughs> so, so <laughs> instead of uh, saving, uh, we be where we're rebuilding. Uh, it's probably okay, but you know we learned something from these really light, you know, lightweight trusses, and which we don't have anymore. Uh, so it's, it's it's like that. So it's not a a simple uh, yeah. thing to yeah. say. Yeah. And it, it, just on that note, is there an interesting uh, internal debate within your office uh, when having to confront uh, historical landmark structures? How invasive will the new architecture be? And uh, what would be uh, the proper intervention? for you from a design standpoint does that become a kind of private ideological battle uh yes uh the, the, there are two kinds of uh uh pressures in china as again anywhere else is a market and there's a media in our office uh as probably you can imagine the uh pressure from the media is actually greater so my 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 younger colleagues uh, would uh, tell me like so and so architect to look at uh, <laughs> the for me in my mind is probably a little too flashy but you know they they like you know, they they are so creative with yeah. their their forms they are you know, there's no doubt you know young Chinese architects are all these now these international stars they 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 do very well that way. But right. at that right. point, it's interestingly for me, uh, now I'm not only Chinese, I'm an old fashioned Chinese. For me, subtlety. Yes. It's yes. an important quality. Um, some people say it's Chinese. I, I think it's more than Chinese. Take uh, uh, in the, 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 uh, the British English language, it's so much like our language because it's not direct. It's so uh, convoluted yeah. <laughs> yeah. in order to be polite, I suppose. And that, that's probably also too much. But for me, so I, and then we do argue. So I, I want to, if I could, I want to make the contemporary intervention visible so that uh, people would uh, know they are later additions or interventions, but yet, uh, I don't want to intrude upon, right. say, right. the the inter integrity of the old structures. And so, that's a beautiful yes. answer. Uh, <laughs> I've got one more question for you, and uh, it starts off by uh, thanking you for a wonderful explanation of your inspiring and uh, inspirational works. I especially enjoyed the comment you made about the image where the young colleague was occupying the top of the beam space, and, and that, of course, railings were going to be added. And I envision that the railing would allow someone to hang their legs over while pondering, uh, letting yourself get lost in the non-scientific temporal metrics is a great description. Can you talk about the buildability of those elements that create the internal and external upheaval? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you can go anywhere you want with that one. No, no, no I, th th there's a, uh, 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 let me, okay. Uh, <laughs> again, uh, e even in China, because, you know, we, we, we are going through a, a kind of a, 
a period uh, in, 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 in the field of architecture, you, you, you see a tremendous amount of creativity and openness on, 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 uh, uh, for architects and also uh, for, uh, for clients. Uh, and still students, and I, I, I talked to in China, would have a misunderstanding of uh, uh -huh. the client architects relationship. Of course they do, you know, because it's quite abstract for them. Yes. You, you yeah. know, uh, the developer, the bad guy. <laughs> uh, and, and, and anyway, uh, our, our, uh, but I, I'm talking about two things, maybe. First of all, it's, it's about uh, how architects communicate uh, again. They are architects very skillful. Even at MIT, I thought I, I, well, I, I maybe should uh, do a course simply called uh, how to meet, to, how to do meetings. Yeah. You bring your agenda, whoever the client, uh, the, the government, uh, bring theirs and the, the contractor, and then you negotiate, right? And, but but something very important, I, I said earlier uh, in a different way, is that an architect, whoever actually, need to believe in, in, in your own ideas. And then also have a bit of a belief in humanity, meaning that if it's an idea that uh, moves you and you truly think it's going to do some good, you may be able to to uh, make it happen. So like the uh, art school, uh, the uh, China Academy of Art, so I, I, I gave a very lengthy uh, presentation of the, the, the educational system and the campus design and so in the end, the president started to, by saying that, so you're not here to present a project. You are here to preach. He, he thought I was a priest. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and then he said, well, you know what? Uh, I bought your idea. <laughs> so uh, so I, yeah, it's like that, you never know. And uh, so I don't see, uh, um a stereotypical uh user or uh, a client for architecture right. and then right. so every single time that's why we try it's not like you know if they definitely wouldn't want something we you know i i you know i'll do something else right so that's part of architectural practice often that uh at least it's sort of it's not invisible, but you, you don't hear much about it. You hear the negative story of uh, you are not allowed to do so, uh, so and so, you know, what, what kind of stuff and so on. However, for, uh, for uh, the other thing is, however, sometimes our, our uh, designs seem to be, uh, to be uh, probably radical in, in certain ways, uh, but, uh, uh, for us, we understand architecture it, 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 as invitation. Yeah. So you invite them to go outside. You invite them to maybe uh, go up to the beam. Uh, today, it's, it's very interesting is that uh, we uh, have not only uh, the traditional media, we have social media. I'm going to tell you about something also we experienced very recently to get in at. Social media changes the way we think about architecture. So for a project I, I didn't show, um, we built this group of new building uh, for uh, a, a fashion company. They really liked it, so mm -hmm. they asked us to renovate their old buildings. Again, those old buildings, they, they are sort of uh, just typical, uh, rather boring buildings. Yet, I still don't think I have a good idea to to really uh, touch them. So I, I decided to leave those buildings alone. 
but to make a corridor to connect actually four bar buildings. This corridor was later designed in such a way that uh, that was the, uh, the, the, uh, the piece of architecture with some quality. It's a very long and narrow building. It's an independent building, building connected to the four bars, but it, it has three stories uh, inside. Uh, it's made of uh, metal. Yeah. And then yeah. guess what? The, the, uh, the client, their reaction was that that's the building people would come to visit uh -huh. and take selfies. They didn't understand. They didn't quite care about logic of making connections. So, you know, they're okay with that. Yeah. They see yeah. it even more so from the angle of social media. I don't know some of the terms in English, and but in Chinese, we say there's going to be a, basically an internet star, you know, this kind of expression. They kind of see it that way. Yeah, and then you know we were delighted to to accept that, <laughs> although we didn't really think about it. So, so this kind of interaction between us and the the, the lay people, basically architects and lay people, is something uh, uh, very uh, important and constructive. So, upheaval or not. Maybe they will be uh, for some other projects, but also there's some really uh, interesting surprises and uh, in store also for the architects, and, you know, good ones. Yeah. yeah. Young Ho, I'm sure you had you experienced this as a administrative leader. You you have to uh, get the students to put their laptops down and and uh, either go to the lecture pre-pandemic or uh, go online and and stop what they're doing and listen um, to a, a guest speaker, uh, a visitor that's been invited into the school uh, to share their unique insights. And I have to say, you know, um, you taught a master class tonight. Thank you to, to our school. Um, we, we could we could have unpacked this and 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 spent many more hours uh, trying to open up e each of the gifts that you gave us and explain in greater detail to to the student body who were just being initiated into this kind of beautiful discipline. Uh, how serious and genuine and thoughtful and timely and and poetically charged your work is and, and you you use the word uh humanism at one point it, it, i think there's a there's a common uh commitment in all of these projects to giving something back to society and to making people's lives better and bringing a sense of uh joy and wonderment uh into their da daily activity and and you're accomplishing that, and it's a it's a noble endeavor, and I congratulate you on behalf of our school, and for that matter, on behalf of the discipline. So, uh, thank you for taking time. I know you had to get up early in the morning for this, but uh, it was exceptional, and I and we appreciate it. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Evan. Nice to see you. Absolutely. <laughs> And, and 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 we hope to have you here in person one day. Yes, I, I would love to do that, to go visit you in the Rensselaer. And, and, okay. all, and all the best with your, your, your current projects, and be safe. Oh. Yeah, thank you, you too. Okay. Bye-bye, okay. good day. night for you. I'm going to get my <laughs> breakfast now. And a, and, a, and a good cup of coffee. <laughs> yes, I will. Thanks I so will. much. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.